let's get started. Uh, thanks for coming to this session. Uh, my name is Patrick Chanezon. I work at Docker. And I'm going to tell you about uh, Docker for devs and ops. Uh, what's new and what's next? There's been lots of uh, changes and announcements in the, in the past few weeks. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, so I, I'm a platform plumber. I spent 10 years building platforms at Netscape and Sun. Then 10 more years evangelizing platforms at uh, Google, VMware, and Microsoft. Uh, Google, it was App Engine. Uh, VMware, it was Cloud Foundry. And Microsoft, it was Azure. And then I, I moved to Docker two years ago. Uh, so uh, first, uh, a little bit of a story of uh, how I see the market right now and why Docker, I think, has been successful. Uh, so. Uh, and I'll use movies as analogies of the different companies. Right now, or, or right now, let's say, in the past uh, four years, we've been in that transition where enterprises started to look at cloud um, infrastructure to deploy their applications. Traditionally, they've been in the data center, uh, highly virtualized v with VMware. So VMware kind of owns the private cloud space. Uh, and then the public cloud providers, uh, their offerings have matured a lot in the past few years. And so a lot of enterprises were wondering when would be a good time to start uh, migrating their workloads. And that happened over the past two years. And it's happening at uh, full tilt right now. Uh, one of the things that enterprise wants on the, on the public side cloud uh, is... Um, uh, they want to have a hybrid story. They want to deploy some of their workloads internally, some of their workloads in public clouds, and they don't want to be stuck with one cloud. So in the context of that transition, there's a big fight between these four companies. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to use movie analogies to explain their position, and that's uh, my point of view. <laughs> so uh, VMware, to me, is like uh, the movie 300. I don't know if you saw that. It's the story of the Spartans who are resisting they are 300, and they're resisting an army of 10,000 Persians who are invading their turf. Uh, they're very courageous. They shout, Sparta! So like VMware has great technology and virtualization that's uh, everywhere in the data center. Uh, but we all know how it ends. At the end, they all die. Uh, so to me, that's the position of VMware today. They're trying to uh, push it back a little bit by doing an alliance with Amazon in the cloud, but I, I'm not very hopeful on that. Uh, then we have Amazon, who created the public cloud market, uh, um, I think back in 2006 or something like that with EC2. So Amazon, to me, the, the best analogy is uh, the movie King Kong, uh, or actually the set of King Kong movies. Uh, so it's this uh, uh, huge ape uh, who lives on this island where they're selling books, and he fights with dinosaurs uh, like Barnes and & Noble and company, and he's stronger than them. He really rules the island. So then one day he decides to go to uh, another place, uh, which is New York, which is the enterprise market. And there he, he breaks rampage and, and uh, wreak havoc everywhere, and people think that he's going to rule New York, and at the end he goes on top of the Empire State Building and he shouts, yeah! Uh, but then at the end, uh, uh, <laughs> all the planes coming from the Azure are kind of destroying him. Uh, so we'll see how that, uh, how that goes in that big fight between Microsoft and, uh, and, uh, and Amazon in the next few years. Uh, to me, Google is very much like um, uh, back to the future. Uh, when I was at Google, we had this product called App Engine that created the pass category. And I tried to sell PaaS to enterprises. We had a version called App Engine for Business at that time. So I went to see enterprises and told them, yeah, you're just pushing your code to our cloud, and we take care of everything. And they just laughed at me. Uh, they said, no way. There are some compliance issues. We want to know where our data is running. We want to run some of our apps uh, inside the firewall. And we don't want to be stuck with one cloud provider. Uh, and so Google technology in general is really advanced, uh, and it's, it's, it feels as if it's coming from the future. And the feeling I had in these meetings was the same feeling that Marty had. Um, so Marty is that character in Back to the Future. He's a, a, a kid from the 80s who goes back in time in the 50s. And there he comes on stage at a prom ball, and he starts playing rock and roll. And they're ready, they're ready for rock and roll. So they, they start to dance, and it's fantastic, and they're discovering rock and roll. Uh, but then at the end, he gets a little bit too excited, and he starts to play hard rock. Uh, and then there's a dead silence, 
like nobody understands that music from the future, they're not ready for it. Uh, and that's really, to me, the, the feeling of the, the Google Cloud. Their technology is fantastic, but they don't give customers the path to go from where they are today uh, to where they need to be in the future. Uh, then Microsoft. So <laughs> Microsoft, to me, is typically uh, Terminator 2. Uh, so <laughs> in Terminator 1 movie, that's the Microsoft of Steve Ballmer from the 90s, for whom uh, open source was a cancer. He's the bad guy. Uh, in Terminator 2, it's the Microsoft uh, from Satya Nadella, uh, which embraces open source, and he's coming back, and this time he's the good guy. Uh, and then Docker in the middle. One of the reasons why I think Docker was successful is that it appeared four years ago at a time when enterprises were starting to wonder how to leverage cloud uh, with that desire to do hybrid, uh, so to have some workloads internally and to use several cloud providers. And Docker provides that isolation layer where once you have installed Docker on each of the cloud providers and internally, you just use the Docker API and you're insulated from what happens behind it while still being able to leverage all the capabilities of the underlying infrastructure. And so I think that's one of the reasons why Docker has been successful. The second reason is that the, the Docker file and the Compose file are great abstractions for devs and ops to collaborate together. And Docker grew at the same time as the DevOps movement, where devs and ops starting to work together instead of, uh, uh, and using the same tools instead of fighting each other. So the, the old stack was uh, hardware, and then you put a fat operating system with lots of packages, and then you, were, you would just run your application on that. Uh, the new stack looks small, something like that, where at the base layer, you have either your virtualization or cloud provider, sometimes bare metal as well. Uh, and like in the majority, it's one of these three cloud providers or VMware for virtualization. Then on top of it, you have a shrunk OS. Uh, and CoreOS started that trend many years ago uh, by creating a small Linux distro that is just designed to run containers. And very quickly, the whole industry followed suite. Uh, so uh, Red Hat has Atomic, Ubuntu has Ubuntu Core. Uh, Rancher, I think, went the furthest uh, in there where they literally have nothing on Rancher OS, but two uh, Docker containers, one for system containers and one for user land containers. Uh, then Photon from uh, VMware, and even uh, Microsoft uh, followed that trend with, uh, in the latest version of Windows Server 2016, there's a version called Nano Server that's really small, doesn't have any UI, you only manage it with PowerShell, uh, and it's designed to run uh, workloads at high density in containers, in Docker containers, uh, in the data center. So on top of that, you have Docker, which is the platform to build, ship, and run distributed applications. Uh, it's pretty open. There's a bunch of plugins for uh, volumes uh, with Gluster. They used to be Flocker, but I think they went down. Uh, but there are there are lots uh, other more. Uh, and then uh, networking uh, with uh, Cisco, Nuage, Calico, Weave. And then on the right, you have orchestration. And so orchestration, it's been a big battle over the past few years. Uh, now I'd say it's it's down to two or three players. There's uh, Docker itself with Swarm mode. Uh, so Docker is an orchestration engine. Uh, Kubernetes by Google uh, and a, a whole lot of other uh, participants in the open source project. And uh, Apache Mesos. So let's talk about Docker. The company itself, uh, what we, our mission statement is to build tools of mass innovation. We're trying to find technology that is useful uh, to create stuff. Uh, and then we package it and we make it usable for everybody in order for people to innovate. Uh, the area uh, that is uh, the most ripe for innovation is the fact that all the devices are coming online uh, and can be programmed. And so our first goal is to build tools to let people program the internet, every devices that are connected. And typically these devices all have different operating system and tech stacks for programming them. Uh, we're trying to create a layer that's uniform where you could build an application that could... Uh, I've seen some examples at customers, for example, where they are, they are having some code to reduce data from... Uh, um, uh, they, they have um, um, industrial automation equipment uh, that generates lots of data, and they build software that uh, runs really close to the uh, automation sensor uh, and reduces the data 
sends it to um, um, a local uh, hub uh, that's already also running Docker where they reduce it further and then this hub sends that to the cloud where they're doing uh, their uh, data processing analysis. So having that uniformity in the, um, uh, in, the, in the whole software supply chain to be able to use uh, the same construct on the same platform to run your software is really valuable. So the way we're building that is uh, uh, as a stack. So we start with standards. So the standards for Docker are created in, uh, or the standards for containers are created in um, an organization that we co-created with 40 members of the industry. There's nearly everybody who's doing containers is part of that. It's called the OCI, the Open Container Initiative. Uh, it's been managed by the Linux Foundation. And there, there are two specs, uh, one for runtime and one for image formats. The specs are approaching 1.0 in a few months. Uh, I think there's a 1.0 RC for the spec already. In a few months, there will be a, a, a final implementation of that, uh, or a final 1.0 uh, spec for runtime. And I think image will follow. Uh, then on top of that, we build infrastructure. So infrastructure are small components uh, that can be used independently. And uh, one example of that is RunC, the, the core, co the, the part of Docker that is created container, that is creating container. Uh, you can use it as a command line and, and use it by yourself. And in order to, uh, to use RunC, you just need to have a root file system somewhere in your path. Uh, and then you specify uh, how you want your container to be isolated in a big JSON file that describes all the isolation characteristics of the container, what the user is, uh, what kind of capabilities it has. Uh, and then you use RunC and it will just create the Linux namespaces and C groups uh, for that container. Uh, so that's an example. So RunC is the reference implementation of the OCI runtime spec, uh, but there are like uh, dozens of other components uh, like SwarmKit, InfraKit, uh, VPN kit, uh, and at Docker we're assembling all these uh, components that you can use independently into a development platform that's called Docker. So developers are using that to build their apps. And then they, when they want to move into production in enterprise settings, uh, we build a commercial product that's targeted to enterprise. So let's talk about the Docker platform. It's a platform to build, ship, and run applications uh, on uh, any infrastructure, so physical, virtual, or bare metal. Uh, any operating system, it works on Linux and Windows. So the, the Microsoft team in the past few years has been uh, adding the same kind of isolation um, uh, primitive that exist in the Linux kernels, uh, namespaces and C groups. They added something similar in uh, uh, the kernel of Windows Server 2016. They had it already in some private versions of Windows they're running in Azure, but now it's available to everybody in Windows Server. And then they re-implemented a backend for Docker that takes care of, uh, that, that uses these primitives in order to create native Windows containers. So with Docker today, you can use, uh, you can create both Windows and, um, uh, and Linux containers. On top of that, you have Docker, uh, which is our platform, and then you can build any app in any language, uh, and it works for devs and apps. So as Docker evolved from a, a single purpose tool uh, for Linux developers uh, over the past four years, so we celebrated our birthday last week, uh, it grew into, a, a, um, into a, a platform that a lot of different type of people are using. So we have mainly four different constituencies. Uh, developers, what developers want is uh, more productivity and they want to get updates faster. Uh, the ops community, uh, they want to have a, a predictable system to deploy and run their apps. Uh, on the enterprise side, they're running business critical applications. So they want uh, something stable, but also with a backport of patches for a longer time. Uh, and plus they want support and certification. And then we have a whole partner ecosystem who are creating containers, all these uh, independent software vendors uh, who are containerizing their application as a good way to consume them. Uh, so what they want there uh, is an ability to certify their, their containers when they're targeting enterprise customers and eventually an ability to monetize. 
So in order to uh, attend to these different constituencies, we created uh, two, two different editions of Docker, uh, what we call uh, community edition and enterprise edition, as well as certification programs. So, so for developers, you have Docker community editions. Uh, typically, people are using them uh, on a Mac or on Windows, so they're using Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, uh, also Docker for Linux. Uh, Community Edition has an Edge channel that's really dedicated to developers, so this channel updates every month. So then you get constantly new features every month. Then every quarter, uh, you get a stable release. So we, we moved to a new versioning scheme uh, last uh, two weeks ago, uh, where we went from 1.12, 1.13 uh, to, uh, uh, to year.month. Uh, so the latest version is called 1703. It's the version that shipped in March uh, 2017. The next Edge version will be 1704 in April 05. And then there will be another stable uh, one uh, in June with 1706. Uh, so then we have, so the, the ops are using the stable channel. And there we have additions for Amazon and Azure and the different cloud providers. Uh, that do a lot of work for you to set up the swarm securely and manage the load balancer and integrate with the underlying infrastructure. Uh, and then on the enterprise side, uh, we have a, a, a version that's certified for the underlying infrastructure uh, and where the, uh, it's the stable version, so every three months, every quarter we ship a new one, but we'll do backports of security patches for one year for this one. And then for the ecosystem, we have Docker Store and a certification program. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, this additions model that's pretty new. That's really, uh, we generalized it two weeks ago. Uh, we started doing that uh, with Docker for Mac, uh, I think it was almost a year and a half ago, uh, when we introduced Docker for Mac. And the notion there is that uh, to set up Docker and optimize it for a specific infrastructure, operating system, hardware, or infrastructure, there's lots of work required. So for example, for Docker for Mac, you have to integrate with the local file system, with the local net networking layer, uh, and you have to build a native UI for the Mac uh, for people to manage it. Uh, an installer uh, where you just drag and drop the Docker application in your applications folder uh, to get started. Uh, and that worked really well. A lot of people are using Docker for Mac. So what we did in the next uh, year and a half is that we started generalizing that. We created Docker for Windows, and then we created cloud versions, Docker for Amazon, Azure, and GCP uh, more recently. And the Docker for Amazon one uh, is really integrated with the Amazon experience. So when you set it up, you can leverage your existing SSH keys on Amazon. It integrates with uh, S3 and with ELB. Uh, and when you're deploying a service and you open a port, it will reconfigure the ELB automatically. So it's doing a lot of work for you to set up a secure uh, swarm on, uh, on Amazon. So we generalize that model to everything. And now all the additions, you can find them on Docker Store. So the CE ones are free and the EE ones uh, come with a subscription. So that's what this looks like. Uh, we have a um, community edition uh, for a bunch of platforms. Uh, um, Mac and Windows 10 for, um, uh, for desktop. Uh, Azure and Amazon for now for, um, uh, for cloud. Uh, but we introduced a beta. Uh, it's still a private beta, so you need to sign up to get in uh, for GCP uh, two weeks ago at Google Next. And then you can find it on the um, uh, free distributions of Linux, uh, Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, and CentOS. Then uh, Docker Enterprise, uh, the difference is that it's certified for the underlying infrastructure. Uh, so, so there we're typically shipping it for the type of infrastructure that people are using in the enterprise. Uh, so the same cloud providers, Amazon Azure, uh, but we have Windows Server there. So when you buy Windows Server 2016, uh, you get uh, Docker EE for free with it. Uh, then there's a SUS Linux, uh, SUSE, Ubuntu, uh, Oracle Linux, CentOS, and Red Hat. And in addition to certifying for the underlying hardware and infrastructure, we're also certifying uh, uh, plugins uh, that you may use uh, for uh, volume and, or, and networking, and we certify containers. 
So what I'm talking about here is that, um, uh, for example, the Cisco or uh, uh, networking plugin or the Hedvig or Nutanix uh, volume plugins are certified. So if you run into issues and you're an EE user under a subscription, you'll be supported by both Docker and these partners. Same thing for the kind of workloads you may run in certified containers, um, like Microsoft SQL Server, GitLab, uh, Withscope. Uh, all these will be supported uh, in conjunction with each of the partner. And so when you're going to Docker Store, you can find this label uh, certified for the containers uh, that have it. A Docker Enterprise Edition comes in three tiers. Uh, three tiers of subscription. The first one, basic, uh, just has the, uh, the engine and the Docker platform. Uh, the standard one is what used to be called Docker Data Center. So in there, in addition to uh, uh, Docker platform, you have uh, image management, uh, container management, uh, with what is called a DTR for images, container management, and uh, management of your running containers with what we call UCP, Universal Control Plane. Uh, multi-tenancy, role-based access control for your teams, uh, integration with LDAP and Active Directory, uh, secrets management with role-based access control. And then the advanced tier, in addition to that, has uh, image scanning uh, that works also on-premise. So what we're trying to build is uh, what we call CAS, Container as a Service, that's a layer between IaaS and PaaS. Uh, and that's a layer that uh, fits better with what ops and devs want uh, from a platform. Uh, and so it, it helps you create a whole supply chain for your enterprise from dev to ops, uh, including the collaboration in between uh, with uh, the registry uh, for managing images. So at the base of it, uh, Docker, uh, on, uh, especially on Linux, is using uh, Linux kernel isolation primitives, namespaces, and C groups. Uh, and there's another aspect that's pretty important is that uh, union file system uh, with uh, image layers. So when you're running uh, 15 workloads on a host uh, that are all based on an Ubuntu base, the Ubuntu base will be downloaded and run only once. Uh, and then all, the, all these layers are added with a union file system. And at the top, there's a writable uh, uh, layer uh, where your container can write. Uh, since uh, last summer, Docker has built-in orchestration. So scheduling of containers, uh, declarative service API, uh, uh, what we call cryptographic node identity, where when nodes talk to each other, they each have certificates and they're talking over TLS. Uh, and we have a built-in routing mesh uh, for, um, uh, for accessing your services. So for example, when you expose a port uh, uh, in, in your container, you can, you, can, you can have what we call host port, where uh, you say, I want to expose port 8080 for, for this service on all the hosts. And port 8080 will be open on, uh, on all, the, um, uh, all the hosts in the swarm. And then any request coming to it will be routed to your services, whatever internal ports they're using in there. So what's new in Docker uh, 1703? A lot. Uh, so first, the Docker EE and CE that we talked about. Uh, so we introduced these additions uh, only two or three weeks ago. Uh, one of the big, uh, big news that's, uh, that's really useful, uh, especially for apps, is a new uh, support for in Compose, a new support for Compose file uh, in Docker itself. Uh, so Docker introduced the service model uh, when, when it introduced orchestration back in the summer, uh, but uh, Swarm mode was not working with Compose files. So now it, it works with Compose files, which means that you can use a Compose file. And in the 3.1 version of the Compose file, there are more details that you can specify if you're an ops for how many replicas you want of that service and uh, what is the update policy for a service. Uh, what kind of secrets you want associated to it. Uh, and then when you have this compose file that developers have been using for developing the app, you just enrich it with these new information and then you can do a Docker stack deploy and specify the compose file and it will create the service on your swarm. Uh, one of the big uh, new features is secret management. Uh, I'll talk about it in more details. Uh, some system commands that people have been asking for many years uh, to prune your uh, unused images and containers. Uh, some uh, monitoring improvement and um, 
there's a new experimental feature where you can have an endpoint that exposes a matrix in the Prometheus format. Uh, a build improvement with the squash command that allows you to squash all your layers into one. Uh, uh, more understandable CPU management, and then the Docker for AWS and Azure editions are now GA. So let's talk about Docker for developers. Typically, they're, they're going to start on a Mac or Windows, and they're downloading one of the editions, uh, and then the, you start with a Docker file. So who here uh, uh, has used Docker already? Yeah, okay, so I'll skip pretty quickly through that. Uh, just the new stuff, so Docker file you inherit from a base image. Uh, you can expose ports. Typically, you're, you're building your, uh, your artifact uh, using another container. Uh, and then you copy the build artifact somewhere in there inside of your container. And here you can launch a command. Uh, so, I'm, so the example I'm going through, uh, through all this talk is a, a Spring Boot application using MongoDB. Uh, so here I have built my Spring application with a fat jar. I just copy that jar somewhere. And the way to start the app is a Java minus jar of uh, my Spring Doge dot jar. So that's the name of my application. And I can pass a, some parameters to it, the, the port I want to open, and the, the URI to the MongoDB database I'm going to use. So here I use an environment variable that will need to be passed uh, uh, when I run it. Uh, one of the new things that uh, not many people know about is um, something that we introduced in, uh, I think, in uh, last summer, last June, a new, uh, um, a new directive in Dockerfile that allows you to specify your health check. Uh, so here, my health check will run uh, uh, every five minutes uh, with a timeout of three seconds, and it will be retried three times before the container is deemed uh, unresponsive. And the command here, I'm just curling uh, localhost on port 8080 to see if my app is, uh, is up and running. So you can, you can craft your own health check, and then uh, a Swarm will know whether your container is, um, uh, is healthy or not, and it can restart it on another host or, or on the same one. So uh, one of the advantage of Docker is that uh, you're not obliged to replace completely what you're doing. You can adopt it piecemeal. So some people are using it just to compile your, their application. So instead of having to install Maven uh, or, or Ruby in this specific version or Python in that specific version, you're just using a compiler uh, um, or, or Go in that specific version. You're just using uh, the compiler tool chain from a container. So here it's a Java app that's using Java 8. Uh, so I'm just going to compile it with the Maven, uh, the Maven container. Uh, and so I, I ju just do a Docker run, minus IT to get a terminal to see what's happening, minus RM, uh, dash dash RM to uh, re remove the container when it's done. And I do a Maven package uh, for my source. So the way I get my source in the container is by mounting a volume. Uh, with a, I, I mount the current directory inside of the container. Uh, the working directory here will be the directory where I have mounted my source. There's one thing for Java developer out there, uh, one thing that's really useful to know, uh, or, or one optimization trick. Uh, so when you're using Maven, Maven downloads the whole internet with all your dependencies and puts them into a, a, a local uh, cache. Uh, if you're running a container like that, containers, uh, the next time you're going to run it is going to re-download everything. So one good way to do that, to avoid that, is to create a, a volume called Maven. Uh, so it will be created inside of the VM where Docker is running. Uh, and then to map that to the, the user.m2 uh, repository uh, so that that cache can be shared between different build, uh, build runs. Uh, then once you've built your artifact and you have your Docker file, you can build an image. So here I do a Docker build. I tag it with my uh, a Docker Hub ID, Shanazon, slash Spring Doge, uh, but you can use other tags. Uh, and then I'm building what's in there. So I'm just going to copy my jar and create the image. And once I've done that, I can run it. So if I have MongoDB running on a host that's, uh, that's, that's called Mongo, uh, I do a Docker run, I pass an environment variable Mongo URI, uh, I open port uh, 8090, and I run my image. And then after that, I can do a Docker push of my image to go to a Docker Hub. 
Uh, Docker Hub, I think you have a few uh, free um, private registries if you want to use that, but you can buy more. Uh, or else a lot of people are using uh, um, the open source registry and they run it internally, or they use another type of registry. And for the enterprise, we have uh, um, the Docker EE um, standard edition uh, comes with a, a DTR, uh, which is a trusted registry. Now, uh, very often, uh, you, the app that you're building is made of uh, lots of containers, uh, so you want to run all of them at the same time, especially in development. Uh, so for that, you're using what is called a compose file. It's a declarative way to specify all the containers in your application. And once you do Docker compose up, all of them will start up. So here I define two services, uh, one for my application with a port mapping. I put a link to, a MongoDB, to the Mongo container, and I have a second service with Mongo with just the image Mongo, so I don't need it to be persistent for that. Uh, and I pass the environment uh, Mongo URI with the Mongo name, which is the name of the service. So then I can do a Docker Compose up, and it will just uh, start all my containers. So I'm just going to show you how that works. Uh, So I have my application that's there. And here I have my, uh, my Java source. Uh, I have my three applications, Spring Doge Web, uh, Spring Doge, and Spring Doge Photo. Uh, so I can start doing a, a, a Maven build. So I'm just good, going to use a, a container. Uh, Uh, yeah, so I have that uh, there. So that's the command I showed you uh, before, and let me make that slightly bigger. Uh, so here I'm running a Maven container, uh, uh, and I, I, I just mount the Maven volume in there so that it doesn't have to re-download all the dependencies, and it's just going to build my uh, Spring Doge uh, uh, jar. Okay, so it's compiling my app, uh, building my jar. Uh, when I'm, um, okay, so it's repackaging that stuff. Uh, so when I'm done the way with that, I'm just going to, uh, uh, I'm just going to uh, package or, or to uh, build my image. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to do a Docker build. Uh, and I'll tag it with 1.1. 1 .1. And I'm using a, a Docker file that's called dockerfile.dev because I have another one that I use for CI CD. Uh, and so when I'm done with that, I have a compose file in there. Uh, let me show you what the. Um, oh, that's the compose file that I showed you before. Um, So that's the, the compose file I showed you before. I'm just going to do a, a docker compose up. And so it's going to start MongoDB. Uh, it's going to start, um, oh, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. So docker compose minus F, oops, to Oh, maybe I'm not in the right. No, I am in the right place. Uh, oh, maybe it's Docker Compose Run. Oh, so it's Docker Compose Run. Uh, ID, prod. Oh, maybe I can do the. Yeah, this one is simple. So I'll use the, the prod one. Uh, so I'm just going to... Up. Okay, so it's starting my application. It's starting... Uh, 
starting Mongo, uh, starting my Java app. Uh, and it's exposing port uh, 8080. So if I go to localhost uh, on port 8080, no. No, it's not because, uh, uh, let me say. So here I need to do a port mapping. And I'm just going to remove the labels there. And just go back there. Okay. So I'm nuking my containers, uh, and then I restart it. Uh, and so this time, it's just going to recreate all that stuff. And when I go on localhost, I'll be able to, uh, uh, to just see it. So while it's starting that, I'll, I'll continue with the presentation because I'm running a little bit late. And there's other stuff I wanted to show you. Uh, so there are lots of examples on GitHub that you can find uh, the, uh, for people who are using G2E. Uh, there's a good uh, example in Docker Labs uh, that Arun has been doing with Couchbase. Uh, now, uh, once you've finished your development, you want to deploy that to production. So let's talk about Docker for apps. Uh, so we have Docker for AWS and Docker for Azure. Uh, and in beta, Docker for GCP, I talked about that. One of the new things that shipped, uh, if you're using the uh, Edge uh, release, is uh, it's still a beta, but it's called Swarm Management. And so it allows you to create a swarm directly from the desktop, have the swarm be managed in Docker Cloud, uh, and it's deploying a Docker for Amazon or, or Docker for Azure edition. Uh, and then you have access to that edition directly from the menu uh, without having to create uh, to SSH and manage your SSH keys and all that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you is Docker stack deploy. So once I've, um, once I've done all that, uh, now I can update my, my compose file uh, to version 3 or 3.1. And there I can add some new uh, keys in there uh, that are tied to deployment of my services. So for example, here I can specify that in production, I want my, uh, my web tier of the application to have two replicas. Uh, and I can specify the uh, update config. So if I have lots of containers, uh, I want to update two at a time uh, or more. Uh, the delay between uh, updating containers when you're doing a rolling update uh, and a restart policy. And so you use that with Docker Stack Deploy. So let me show you what it looks like. So here, I have this new menu. When I'm logged in with, as Chanazon here, so that's my Docker ID. So when I'm logged in with my Docker ID, I have this, I can see all my repositories here and I can see my swarms. And here I could say, hey, I want to create a new swarm. So I'm led to the Docker Cloud UI. And there I, can, I have put all my uh, Amazon credentials in Docker Cloud. And then I can say uh, uh, I want to create a new swarm that's called PAT AWS2. I click on Amazon and then I specify the region where I want to deploy it. Uh, so I want to deploy that in, uh, I don't know, uh, North California, the swarm size. Oh, so do I have my SSH keys in North California? I don't remember. Yeah, I have it. So I have my SSH keys that are coming from Amazon. Uh, I can specify how many managers I want, uh, how many workers. So here I, I'll just reduce that uh, to this. And then I can specify the size of the VMs I want, and I can click Create. So I, I've done that before. And it's using CloudFormation behind the scenes. And here you can see my uh, um, PAT AWS uh, swarm that's been deployed. And when I go there, uh, in swarm, I see my swarm. I see that it's running. And when I click there, it's just going to open a terminal uh, and do all the setup for me uh, to, uh, 
to be able to, uh, to connect to my swarm. Uh, so if I do a Docker info in there, uh, I should see the information about the remote swarm on Amazon uh, that's running in there. So let's take a look. So I have six containers running on that, uh, on that version. I have one manager and three nodes. Um, and if I, so, and let's take a look at uh, the environment variable that is created to me. What it does, the way it does that is that uh, Docker, it's really integrated with Docker Formax, so it's creating a local Unix socket, uh, then, then does a SSH tunnel to the swarm. Uh, there's a container that's running uh, on my Mac that's doing the SSH tunnel to the swarm and sets it up all for me. So here I can do a Docker service uh, ls and see what services are running today on my swarm. Uh, so only the Docker Cloud server proxy is running because I, I haven't done any workloads there. Let's see where I am. Uh, maybe I should go back to my uh, Spring Doge application. So I'll just take that. Uh, so I have a Docker Compose file there. Uh, uh, that has the deploy parameters uh, uh, for um, uh, th that I want to use. So here I can say Docker stack deploy dash dash compose file. Compose file. Uh, so it's called Docker compose dot yaml, uh, and I'll call it uh, Doge. And so. So now Docker is talking to my swarm in swarm mode uh, that's, on the, uh, uh, that's running on Amazon. And it's going to deploy my application. Uh, so it's going to create uh, the service Mongo, the service web. If I do a Docker stack PS uh, of Doge, uh, I can see my, my various services who are running. Uh, and if I, I look at so I, so I have uh, three tasks, Doge Web 1 and Doge Web 2, uh, that are running here yeah, on different machines. So the Mongo and Web are running on one worker. Uh, Doge Web is running on another worker. Uh, and then when it's ready, uh, it's going to reconfigure the load balancer from Amazon automatically uh, to open the port that I exposed. Uh, so I think I exposed port 80. So I map port 80 to 8080. So that means port 80 is going to be taken on the load balancer uh, for my application. Uh, it may take a while to start, uh, but that's the ELB address. Let's see if it's already up and running. Uh, and while I'm doing that, maybe I can, oh yeah, so my local host one at least is running now. Um, let's see if it's running on AWS and before, Instead of waiting that it, uh, for it to start, I'll show you later. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the enterprise version. Um, and the goal is uh, agility, portability for developers and control for apps. Uh, I talk about the subscription tiers. One aspect that's super important and very differentiated in Docker is security. Uh, so we're trying to make what we call usable security. When you set up a swarm by default, each node has its own certificate. All the nodes are talking together using TLS. And recently we introduced app secrets. Um, and I'll show you app secrets are, are much more secure than uh, other platforms I've heard of. Uh, then trusted delivery, we have image signing with Docker Content Trust, image scanning, uh, encryption at rest, TLS encryption. Uh, and then a user role-based access control. Universal control plane looks something like that. There's a pretty deep uh, permission model where uh, you will give view only for people who only need to view containers. Restricted control is for your team where they can create uh, as many containers as they want, but they won't see the containers from other projects. And then full control is for uh, sysadmins and the admin uh, manages all that stuff. So let's talk a little bit about the integrated uh, uh, secrets management. 
So you have a new command in Docker called Docker Secrets. So you can do a Docker Secret create and create some secrets uh, that are going to be stored, encrypted in the internal distributed store that Swarm is using. Uh, and then when a container is scheduled uh, to use a secret, uh, the secret will be transmitted over TLS just to the node where that container is running and exposed just to that container instead of a tempfs uh, a file system that disappears, that's in RAM, so it disappears when the container uh, dies. Uh, so you can contrast that with, uh, for example, Kubernetes secrets management where uh, the secrets are stored unencrypted in ETB. Uh, and if so, if someone uh, compromises your cluster, he has access to all the app secrets. Security scanning, I talked about that. I just want to show you how, uh, oh, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the built-in HTTP routing mesh. That's brand new. Uh, it's, on, it's in uh, Docker EE. So now we have HTTP level uh, routing in addition to the routing mesh we had. Uh, with HTTP level routing, you can specify a host for your application to be routed to. And so I'll show you an example of deploying our, our so let's see, oh, so it's running on Amazon now, on my two replicas. Uh, and I'll just show you a quick, um, a quick compose file. So this one is for DDC. Uh, it's the same application, but here I'm using, um, I'm using uh, HTTP routing mesh. So here I need to add that application on the UCP HRM network, which is managed by uh, Universal Control Plane and which will allow the uh, load balancer, which is an HA proxy, uh, to access the container. And then I can put a label, so come docker UCP mesh HTTP, and I say on port 80, I want the external route uh, for that load balancer to be uh, springdoge.chainazon.com, uh, and the internal port that I'm exposing is 8080. So I'm just going to take that stack file and I'm going to go to my UCP instance. This one is running on Azure. Uh, so I deployed it uh, using the uh, 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 Docker store. So Docker store, when you go to the uh, Azure version, just goes into uh, the Azure marketplace where, uh, where you're led into the Azure portal and you deploy it in a few clicks after specifying a few things. So I have that running in there. And I'm just going to uh, go to resources. And in the resources, I'm going to deploy a new one. Uh, I'm going to call my stack uh, doge. I just paste it in there. I want to see verbose logs, and I'm just going to create it. And so the result of it is that um, I have changed. So uh, uh, shanazon.com is my own domain. So I went to Gandhi, and I put the IP address of the uh, Azure uh, load balancer that's fronting my install. Uh, as, um, as the host um, of the IP address for the Spring Doge and Spring Doge 1 and Test 1 and a lot of different domains uh, mapping to that. Uh, and so now it's deploying my stack. And when it will be deployed, if I go to springdoge.chanazon.com, I think I, I put Spring Doge, uh, the app should be uh, routed to uh, from there. It may take a while for these uh, containers to start. Uh, but what I wanted to outline is that here, I could have um, a different version of the application running on the same port. On Spring Doge 1, uh, I'm going to take the version 1.1 of my image, and I'm going to create a new stack and deploy it. So it's not deployed yet, uh, but I'm going to deploy the new one. So that's version 1.1 of my Spring Doge application. It's just going to put them on any nodes in there, uh, but then the HRM load balancer is just going to ba uh, load balance anything with Spring Doge 1 to, uh, uh, to that host. Okay, so has it been created? I think it has. Okay, oh yeah, it's updating it now. Okay. Uh, and let's see if it's up now. No, it's still, oh yeah, it's up. So it's up and running. Uh, and then if I go to uh, uh, the Spring Doge one, I don't know if it's deployed yet. It may take a little while. 
uh, I should have my new 1.1 version of it uh, running. Uh, so I think I'm out of time. So that concludes the talk. Do you guys have any questions? All right. So to, to go further, um, to go further, in order to get the Docker editions, you go to uh, docker.com slash get docker. Uh, beta.docker.com if you want to try out the GCP version of it. Uh, all my slides are on SlideShare and I'll post these uh, there. And some of the code of the stuff I showed you is on uh, my GitHub repo in Docker tips. And if you go to Docker Labs, you'll find uh, uh, more to play with. All right, thank you. I'll be out there for questions. Thanks. Thank you.